Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Hope everybody had a nice little break, got some coffee, did whatever you need to do. Check some emails. Um, all right, so last session of our series today. Um, just a quick reminder, as always, meet yourself as you have questions, put them in the chat. Um, the, I'm going to introduce our next two speakers. So first up is Greg Hoke. Uh, before moving to Minnesota two decades ago, Greg did his graduate work in Flint Hills of Kansas. After teaching for almost a decade, he spent two years with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and has been with the Minnesota DNR for the last nine years, where he's currently the Prairie Habitat Supervisor in the Division of Fish and Wildlife. Greg has published three books on wildlife and has a book on the tall grass prairie coming out this spring. After Greg presents, we have Kelly Anderson. Kelly has been a livestock specialist with the Minnesota Department of Agriculture since 2009. In 2012, she helped to develop the conservation grazing program and policies used by Minnesota DNR and currently works with them to write grazing plans for state owned land. In addition to her duties with the Minnesota Department of Ag, Kelly and her husband also run a herd of 150 Angus cows in West Central Minnesota. They have worked with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to rotationally graze nearby waterfowl protection areas, production areas to benefit wildlife habitat for the past 18 years. Uh, Kelly is also going to be joined by her husband, Bill, um, to kind of give that producer perspective and to answer any questions that y'all might have for producers who graze on public land. So first up is going to be Greg. And so thank you both for, for being willing to present and share your expertise with us. And Greg, I'm going to hand it off to you. Yeah, uh, thanks, Kelsey, for, for having me here. Um, yeah, in 20 minutes, you're going to be really sick of hearing from people named Greg H., but uh, we'll, uh, we'll see how it goes here. Um, so hopefully what I'm going to try to do is provide some, some of the more of the science, um, as, as Kent asked for at the, during the last, uh, uh, a little more qualitative. I'm going to be a little more quantitative here. Um, first off, just talk about uh, some of the discussion yesterday, support for public lands grazing. Um, what I've noticed in my work is there's a, a real difference between what an organization um, is thinking and saying and maybe what individual hunters and as a state wildlife agency, hunters are one of my primary constituents. Um, so I was flipping through, um, this is an, a magazine from Ducks Unlimited um, from about a year ago. In fact, they've had a series of really nice articles on working lands um, over here is a podcast from Pheasants Forever. Um, in fact, Pheasants Forever has just started hiring grazing specialists. Um, Audubon has their, their bird friendly beef uh, program or their certification. Um, so a lot of the, the organizations are, are really, really supportive of grazing. Um, however, um, last week in our outdoor, the Minnesota Outdoor News newspaper, which you Midwesterners are probably familiar with, we had that the, the, the Minnesota DNR is creating a travesty um, by allowing grazing um, on WMAs. Um, so there, there's still a disconnect um, within a, a lot of the, the individual constituents. Um, as Mary C said yesterday, that quite often just takes some conversations. I know I'll have oh, anywhere from five to 10 people call me every summer, usually pretty ticked off um, it's sometimes an hour, hour and a half, two hour conversation. But by the time we get done, they're like, oh, okay, yeah, um, I see what you're saying. Um, so it just takes a little bit of investment and quite often multiple investments. But people will come around once they kind of see, you know, again, what you're trying to do. Um, you're not just going out there and trying to create a, a cow burnt pasture. Um, grazing workloads and benefits. Um, this has been talked about a little bit um, in, by some of the others, and I'll just knock this off before I get into the sciencey stuff. Um, prescribed fire, there's a lot involved in prescribed fire, and I don't need to belittle it, and I've done many, many burns myself. But from to compare it, you have a burn plan, you do the burn. Once the burn is wrapped and the smoke is out, you pretty much walk away for the most part. Um, with grazing, You've got a grazing plan. You've got to develop some relationship with your producers. You've got fencing, electricity, water. You've got escaped cattle. You've got storm that knocks down the fence. Um, you should be doing it, you know, should be monitoring, um, you know, like once a week or so. Um, and it can be really time consuming to do all of that. Um, and if you're an agency staff and you're 
you know, used to have three or four people in your office and there's one of you left um, because of, you know, hiring freezes with COVID and things like that. Um, grazing can, can look to be a little daunting or challenge. Um, however, um, there's a lot of benefits. Um, and again, I don't want to oversimplify fire because I like fire. Um, but with fire, you've got basically burned and unburned. You can, you know, a little, you know, early spring, late spring, late summer. But it, I don't want to say it's a binary condition, but it's almost a binary condition. It's burned or it's not, it's not burned. With grazing, we can play around with the seasonality, the length, the stocking rate or intensity. We can look at the size of the area. Um, if something isn't working that year, it's a drought year. Um, or it's a really, really wet year, um, you can just pull the cattle off in many cases. Um, with a fire, once that head fire is going, you're not pulling it back. Um, so grazing can be daunting, um, but it also provides a lot of flexibility and a lot of fine tuning. Um, I've, I've said before, and, and maybe it's an exaggeration, um, fire can be a bit of a sledgehammer, grazing can be a surgical scalpel you can do really, really precise things with grazing. Um, it may take a little time, a little effort, a little learning on everybody's part, but once you get comfortable with it, you can do some really amazing stuff. Okay, and then fire grazing interactions. I'm not gonna talk about patch burn grazing. A couple people have already mentioned it. That's a whole other topic in and of itself. Um, but this just shows some of the fire grazing interactions. So over here on the right, you know, this is your typical unburned prairie and it's black. Um, this is some grazed prairie down in the Flint Hills. This is Kanza Prairie. I think it's Watershed N4D, but I'm not sure. Um, and you get this really complex patchwork of burned, unburned, grazed down pretty tightly so there's no residual. Here's some residual vegetation that was protected. Um, and I know Greg in the last one talked about um, in Missouri, they really talk about the patchiness. This is what they're talking about, um, both with grazing and with fire. Okay, the ecology of grazing, we can boil it down, we can make it really complex, we can also make it really, really simple. Um, take half, leave half. Um, that's not an ecological thing, that's something that came out of, out of the ranching community. I, I haven't been able to trace where it came from, it's, it's an old adage, but it works. Um, what I'm going to do with the rest of this presentation is basically, I'm not going to provide the numbers, I'm basically just going to provide quotes, primarily out of the abstracts for studies, um, or um, the end of the conclusions. Um, and you'll notice that a lot of the sites I have here are not super common. This is stuff we've known for, for quite a while. Um, as a general rule, cattle and ducks can live together reasonably well at the same site when grazing is sufficient to remove half the average amount of annual forage. Um, so the way I like to say this is take half for the cattle, leave half for the critters. Um, grazing has two primary effects that I'm going to make argue. There are lots of effects. I'm going to lump them into two general categories. Um, and I'm going to uh, abuse the principle of alliteration um, and say that beef begets blooms, creates bugs, creates birds. Um, and again, from a wildlife agency perspective, I really like to focus a lot on, on the bird side of things. Um, so there's two primary ways we can, we can help the birds and other wildlife the structure of the vegetation, as well as the diversity of the vegetation, which then relates to the invertebrates. Um, inverts are really interesting by themselves. Um, I swear for every phone call I get about pheasants, I get about 10 phone calls for about pollinators. And it's been that way for the last several years. Um, however, in my world, um, insects are the base of the food chain for many wildlife species, um, especially game birds and songbirds. Okay, so again, diving into some of the really current literature from World War II, um, loafing areas and wetlands. Um, um, Hochbaum and Souls, if you're in the if you're in the, the if you're knowledgeable about the duck literature, those are going to be very very famous names that are instantly recognizable. These are work primarily done up at uh, Delta Marsh up in Manitoba. Uh, the trampling of edges by cattle destroys the vegetation and creates loafing areas for ducks. And then Hochbaum writes, water without an acceptable loafing area is not an acceptable territory to these species. And he's talking about waterfowl in general there. Okay, nesting cover. We've had this dense nesting cover mantra, the DNC mantra for both ducks and also um, for pheasants for, for decades. However, 
that's really a, a more of a mallard mindset. Um, again, hoke bomb from the 1940s, lightly grazed pastures used by territorial pairs of blueing teal, shovelers, pintails, and lesser scops, and species that prefer a more open grassland for nesting. Again, the key there is lightly grazed. Take some, leave some. Um, and then Bell Rose from 1980, um, his ducks, geese, and swans of North America, basically pulled out his quotes about some of those same species. Um, not every species needs that waist high thatch, or at least knee high thatch, um, which a lot of people um, still wanna, wanna believe. Then when you get into the songbirds and the shorebirds, um, marbled godwits, upland sandpipers, upland plovers, if you're a big Leopold fan. Um, marbled godwits, I never see these in our wildlife management areas and our waterfowl production areas that aren't grazed or burned, where you've got that, you know, that, that waist high thatch. They will not nest in that. Show me a grazed pasture or a grazed public land, and I can almost always find you a marbled godwit or an upland sandpiper. Um, some of the more recent research, um, this is coming out of uh, southeastern or northeastern South Dakota. Um, some research done by the, the Nature Conservancy. Um, grazing can be used to increase the abundance of some grassland species, even at moderately high stocking rates. Nest predation. Um, let's go back to the 1930s. Um, uh, Bennett, um, his, his study, the blueing teal, which was in northwestern Iowa, Light grazing apparently destroyed the ideal skunk and badger habitat in the study area. Um, so what he, he was trying to argue, again, the take half, leave half, take, take enough to expose the predator, leave enough to conceal the nest. Grassland structure. Um, the cow paths that, um, that uh, cows leave through the grass, those are great ways for cattle to move around the landscape. They're really, really good ways for birds to move around the landscape. Um, Bennett and Hochbaum both talk about duck broods um, moving through the landscape. In fact, Hochbaum talks about a brood will travel for several miles along a cow path versus going a distance measured in a few yards. And he was there specifically talking about a brood leaving the nest and going to the quote unquote nearest wetland. It's quite often not the nearest wetland if there's a good path to get to a wetland that's a little more different, a uh, uh, little further away. Um, and then Baker, 1953, uh, the Prairie Chickens of Kansas, um, talks about young prairie chickens also following these paths. And then the, the, the opening areas, the shorter, the shorter, more heavily grazed areas, great places for them to warm up and sun um, in the grasslands. Most wildlife agencies today do um, August roadside survey counts where we count pheasants along roadsides. The reason those pheasants are out on the edge of the gravel is because it was a really wet, dewy night and they're cold and wet. So they come out onto the edge of the road uh, to dry off. If we've got a little bit of grazing out there, there should be some of those shorter patches. They can go out and warm up in the sun and dry off and not have to go out on the road. Grassland structure and foraging. Um, again, focused on young birds. Um, some here's some, actually some recent studies. Um, one, the top one is from, uh, I believe, Iowa. The bottom one is from Nebraska. Feeding rates of bobwhite chicks were sensitive to vegetation influence mobility. Management of fields for both pheasant and quail chicks can be reconciled by practices that permit more open space at ground level, i.e. grazing. Um, we suggest that land managers for greater prairie chickens provide brood rearing habitat in grazed upland ecological sites. Again, going after the, the mobility um, issue there. Um, now there've been many, many dozens um, probably of studies from across uh, grasslands showing the, 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 the role of grazing relative to plant diversity. The caveat to that is with too much grazing, too often too intensive, it can be a really good um, way to uh, um, add invasive species to your site. So again, that's where some of the fine tuning comes in. Um, the mechanism, quite simple. Um, grazers focus on grass. When you remove the grass, you release the competition for the forbs or wildflowers and they do better. Um, this is a photo of a recent easement that the Fish and Wildlife Service just took out in Clay County. Um, it was grazed the year before. I have never seen wild wildflowers like I have seen at this site. And I've, I've been to quite a few sites over my, the last 30 or so years. 
um, pollinator diversity. Um, all of these arthropod variables were, were significantly positively correlated to plant species richness. Um, and then this, is, this was, I believe, a Kansas study, um, an Oklahoma study. The shifting mosaic created by a patch burn treatment provides habitat that meets the requirements of a broad range of invertebrate species. Um, again, go back, go back to that photo I had um, at the beginning of the real patchy burn. We do know that a lot of over, uh, insects overwinter some in the soil. They love a good hot burn because the ash on the soil surface warms up the soil. But there are a lot of inverts that also um, overwinter in the vegetation. If you do one big fire that white, you know, that you know, turns everything black, you're probably killing the vast majority of those invertebrates that are wintering in the vegetation. If you've got that patchy fire that kind of trickles across the landscape, lots of lots of places for larvae, eggs, etc., uh, to escape a fire. Um, study from Kansas on lesser prairie chickens: practices that maintain or increase forb cover grazing will likely increase vertebra invertebrate biomass and habitat quality. Um, some studies from the Flint Hills, um, Kanza Prairie, grasshopper density was seven of seven of nine grasshoppers responded positively to grazing, and there were 75% more grasshoppers in grazed areas. Now, if you study the prairie chicken literature, the pheasant literature, grasshoppers are basically chick candy. Um, that's a lot of what those young birds um, are, are hitting on um, through their that first summer of their life when their diet is pretty much 100% insect for the first several weeks. Okay, we need a little bit of everything out there. Nesting habitat, brooding habitat, fall habitat, winter habitat. Those can all look very different, um, even for one species. And um, none of us are managing for a single species. There's a lot of different species out there. Um, one species near and dear to my heart is the prairie chicken. Um, so in the prairie chicken, in the spring, they need really, really short grass um, for their booming grounds. Um, in the summer, they need kind of short or patchy grass. That's where the good brood cover is. And then fall, fall and winter, they're going to want a little bit thicker cover um, for, uh, for, for thermal insulation during the winter. Um, just a little bit of the literature overview. Um, Again, these yeah date from 1938 to 1964. Thus, it seems as though grazing to a certain extent is needed even today. Leopold, um, a partly hayed country is more favorable than one left entirely uncut. Um, Baker, again, prairie chickens in Minnesota. The best practices the rec or the, the practices recommended for the most profitable long-term use of grasslands are also beneficial to prairie chickens. And I'll let you read those last two. Um, if you get into the, the patch burn grazing literature, um, which is, there's a lot of it. A lot of it's come out of that Tallgrass Prairie Preserve um, in Oklahoma. And what they're showing um, with patch burn grazing, specifically grazing in general, is it used to be basically you had to sacrifice your grazing uh, to get good wildlife habitat. What a lot of the, the, both the ecological and the economic research is now showing is that what's the best for long-term pasture management for your wildlife is the best long-term habitat management or pasture management for cattle equals good habitat management for wildlife. <clears throat> so there is really no trade-off. You can really have the best of both worlds. Again, it takes a little bit of planning, a little bit of care, uh, but it's not a, you have to have a trade-off from one to the other. Um, and that's going to be a really good selling point with both the conservation and the agricultural community um, that you can have one plot of land, public or private, and really get a lot of multiple benefits out of it. And you really don't, again, you don't need to trade off one for the other, uh, which some of us used to seem to think um, in the past. And with that, that's the, that's the end of my presentation. I'm going to stop sharing here and hand things over to Kelly. All right. Well, thank you, Greg. Um, so that was, if you're not convinced already um, to give this grazing thing a try, uh, I, I don't know what else I can say to you, but um, hope, hopefully you're at least looking at it if you haven't already. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the logistics and how, how to get this up and running um, in your, your agency or your state. Um, I'm going to piggyback a little bit on what Mary C. talked about um, as they got their program up and running in um, in Wisconsin, and uh, we 
we are just a couple years ahead of them as far as the number of years under our belt. But I think we definitely have some different things that we can learn from each other. So, um, and I don't have a PowerPoint because I wasn't sure what I, I want. I didn't want to double up on what everybody else was talking about. So I didn't want to prepare anything, but I do have some things that I will share with you as I, as I go through and discuss some of this. So to begin with, um, in uh, Minnesota in 2012, the, the state legislature passed a bill that basically said, thou shalt do some grazing and any money that you collect for it can be kept within this grazing program. Um, so any fees that the DNR were to charge for grazing, we're gonna be able to be kept within that program instead of going back to the general fund. Um, and that, that, was, uh, as a that was a result of some, um, the State Cattlemen's Association was really anxious to get that going. And then um, there were, we had a, a few land managers here in Minnesota who had been doing some successful grazing prior to 2012. So it wasn't that the legislature said, now you have now, now you can do this, and, and all of a sudden it was allowed. It had been going on before that. Um, and I, I see uh, at least one person on the, I think I saw um, uh, Mark Papish, I think was on here. And he was one of those people um, doing grazing long before uh, uh, the legislature gave this, um, made these changes. Um, there was a couple other state, uh, state land managers that were doing it as well um, that kind of paved the way for a lot of other people to give it a try so after that legislation um, what what we ended up doing and I was just getting into to um, uh, assisting the DNR at this point and um, basically what we did is we came up with a number of documents and and some different guidance um, that that would help land managers uh, start doing some of this grazing um, and that's where I'm going to share my screen over here. So hopefully you can see this document and I am not going to go through all of it because it's many pages long, but I think this is really similar to what Mary C was saying that they're about to be putting out in Wisconsin. Um, this is our statewide operational grazing plan and what this does is it, it outlines all of the justification for grazing here in Minnesota. It talks about a lot of that historical data that, um, that Greg just went over um, it talks about, like, the, like I said, the financing and, and, and where that money goes to and comes from the, you know, the resources and talks about, you know, why this needs to be done and, and, and why it's a good tool. Also lays out some of the groundwork for fencing and signage and how we give, get minerals and what type of livestock will be used. Um, like I said, it, uh, it's a very comprehensive document and really meant to be a big overview grazing plan. Now this doesn't get into any site specifics or anything like that. It's really just a, a very big overview as to how grazing will take place in Minnesota. Um, so there's that. Uh, we developed that along with, let's see, what's this guy here? Oh, this was another document that I'm not going to go into really in depth, but this was another piece people were concerned about dewormers um, and insecticides used on cattle that would possibly um, uh, hinder uh, um, invertebrates and, and um, pollinators. So we came up with some guidelines as to how uh, cattle could and should be treated with um, deworming and, and, and insecticides before they went out on, on the sites. Uh, we also came up with some fencing standards. That's the one I was looking for. Um, and, and this ended up being a, um, a good and a bad thing. So as you can see the fence here, um, it's a pretty robust fence. And this is the type of thing, this is what, what the fencing standards required to begin with. Well, like I mentioned, we had some, some uh, land managers who were successfully applying grazing on certain areas around the state uh, prior to these, <laughs> these guidelines coming into place. And what we found out was that once we came up with these fencing standards, a lot of the grazing that they had been doing was no longer allowed because they, they were getting by with fences that, that weren't quite this robust. And then by requiring this kind of fence, um, it just, it really made it uh, economically impossible to be able to, um, to apply some of this grazing, especially in areas where uh, maybe they, you know, 
just uh, they want, kind of wanted to try it and, and maybe not do a permanent grazing plan. So that was one of the things that we learned early on was uh, going to be a hindrance to us. Um, and a lot of that we talked to uh, like somebody had a question in the last presentation about um, liability issues. This the main reason for this type of fence was uh, because there was concern about uh, liability. Um, here in Minnesota, state statute says that um, uh, the person who owns the cattle is responsible for them when they get out, no matter where they are, if they're on, if they're on their own land or if they're on leased land. Um, but uh, um, the DNR wanted to make darn sure that uh, they were putting up a really good fence around around these units in order to um, to, to uh, reduce any possibility that they would be getting out. Um, and that was a tough one. That was a, it, it, this. There was a lot of pushback on this, and like I said, it ended up really hindering our grazing program uh, when when we first got started. Um, let's see, fencing standards. Okay, so like I said, those were a couple of the issues. Another one that we ran ran across, kind of along those same lines, was um, an insurance requirement uh, in the the statewide grazing plan that I showed you earlier. Um, there, uh, one of the one of the things that a was established in there was an insurance requirement that said that any cooperator with the state of Minnesota had to have a one point five million dollar umbrella or insurance policy, and they had to name the state as um, as insured on there. Um, and initially, you know, we worked with the state cattlemen's association and, and kind of thought that that should end up, that should be okay. But as we went on, um, we found that a lot of the producers that were willing to do this kind of grazing just didn't carry that kind of policy, and it ended up being um, more of a, more of a hindrance for them. So um, we were able to get that reduced um, to a million dollars, and uh, that that ended up opening some options. So, like I said, some of these ended up some of these were got to be um, some issues, and what we did, I'm going to try to find it here. So the, the fencing, after lots of hoping and pushing and discussion, we were able to come up with a, uh, I'm not gonna find it here, it's option seven. We were able to come up with what we called a remote area temporary fencing. And this is, can only be used in, in areas that are away from, um, uh, away from major highways or interstates. And what it says is that we can now use a two strand um, wire fence that can be put up every year and taken down um, so that we can do more temporary fencing and get by with maybe just trying to, you know, if some if a if a land manager wanted to do a real quick, you know, hey, let's let's try this this year and see how it works. Um, it, it, get, it opened up some opportunities to do those sort of short term grazing plans rather than uh, jumping into something that was going to require a $40,000 fence. Um, so uh, I think, uh, Adina, that's what I just addressed. You had a question in the chat that said, how do we make it more flexible? We did, uh, we did end up adding this option to do some temporary fencing. And um, these documents, I have a whole bunch of these kind of documents. Yeah, you can either contact us or if there's a way to share documents within the regain um, that, that chat or that uh, networking group, I can put them in there too. Uh, so those were a couple things that we came up with. Another one that's kind of fun, um, let's see if I can find it here, was the conservation and grazing map. So as you can imagine here in 2012, we're all gung-ho to, to really um, start pushing this, uh, the, the grazing program and expanding this. And what we did early on was we, we pulled a bunch of the, the state land managers and said, okay, so if you could put grazing, if you, if, if you wanted to put grazing out, what units would you put this on? And we ended up getting this list of different uh, wildlife management units and thought, oh, this is, this is great. We had, I don't know, 100,000 acres that we could have grazed. So all we got to do is uh, line up a, a cooperator to be able to do that, right? So I came up with this conservation grazing map and early on 
you would have seen lots of little points all over this map, especially on the western side of Minnesota, because what we did is we advertised. <laughs> we said, these are the units that we want to be able to graze, and here, are, here they are, here's where they're located, and if you click on them, it will give you the contact information. So uh, a lot of these wildlife managers had given us that information, not realizing that it would be put out to be public. <laughs> And they started getting phone calls saying, I want to graze this unit, I want to graze that unit. And we just weren't ready for that. It, we, we, we got up and we went a little bit too fast. So I think it was Greg said, we, gotta, we, we have to take those points off the map. <laughs> People are getting mad. Um, so we did, we, we took the points off the map. And what this is now, it's, it's still useful. Um, it doesn't list uh, individual sites to be grazed. But what I direct people to this for is, uh, for example, I'm over here in West Central Minnesota. If I live in an area and I know there's public land near me and I just need to figure out who to get a hold of, I can click on the map and it will tell me the contact information for that, the DNR in that area. So that's what I use this map for now. This is available on the, the state of Minnesota website. Um, but uh, that was just another, another little thing that we tried to do and, um, probably wasn't the best idea right off the bat. Uh, a couple other things that we have, I'm just trying to go through my notes here. What else was I going to talk about? Oh yeah, we, there were some questions about um, fees and um, how do we figure out fees? And uh, the with the Fish and Wildlife Service, they have it kind of easy in that they can open up for bids and um, you know the, the grazing goes to the highest bidder. Uh, that makes it, oh, like I said, maybe a little bit easier on there, on the manager's end, um, but it does, uh, it doesn't allow for the manager to maybe work with the best person for, to do the job. And my husband can talk a little bit about that later because um, we graze fish and wildlife land and, and um, we've kind of fallen into that a little bit. Now with the state land here in Minnesota, we do uh, charge a grazing fee. And that grazing fee is different for different areas of the state. It's based on the, um, the FSA pasture rental rates. So it's, it varies from, I want to say, around $6 an AUM to over $40 an AUM, depending on where you are in the state. Um, so that's what people end up paying. However, um, we, we, end up, we end up taking deductions. And this I put together this calculator. Um, to help figure that out. So what we've got here is uh, it's, just, it's a Excel calculator and we can put in how many cows, how many calves we're going to have, how many, how many animal units that is, how many days that they're going to be there. And, and in this case, the AUM fee is set at $22. So what's the grazing fee for that going to be? Well, it's going to be $2,640. Um, so let's just say the fence was in place and all the producer had to do was go and drop the cattle off there and let them go. That's what he would end up paying for the, for the season. However, usually we're asking them to do a little bit of work on the site. Um, sometimes they need to fence the whole thing, like, like is in the case with the, um, the, uh, uh, the portable or removable, removable fencing, the temporary fencing. Uh, so we can start taking deductions there. If they had to put in a thousand feet of fence, um, a, a typical deduction would be a hundred dollars for that. Let's say they have to they have to haul water. Um, there's a deduction for that. If they're only going to be there for a portion of the season, there's a deduction for that. So then what we end up doing is adding up all those deductions and coming up with a net fee. And I use this calculator just to kind of give the producer an example of about what it's going to cost them for the grazing. Because a lot of times going into something like this, they want to know <laughs> if I'm going to put all this work in, if I'm going to haul my cattle 25 miles and ha have to come and check on them every day, um, uh, what's it going to, what's going to cost me? What, what am I going to get out of it? So this is a good way to do that estimate. And then uh, at the end of the season, we can use this to come up with their final grazing fee um, for, to, based on exactly how many days the cattle were out there and how much work they did. So that's how, that's how it's typically done um, with the state, with the DNR grazing plans. 
Um, let's see here. So that was another one. And then uh, another thing that we just developed this year was um, out of necessity was, um, so, so typically our grazing plans, I have one more document to show you guys here. My husband's getting antsy, he wants to talk. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, um, this is uh, this is a temp template that we put together back in 2012 when we first want started wanting to get more people to try out grazing. And this template is our basic grazing plan. And this was designed so that um, a wildlife manager with you know, maybe just a little bit of knowledge of cattle and, and grazing could take a look at this template and write their own grazing plan. Now, luckily, if they're not willing to do this or they're not comfortable doing it, I can step in and help them. But um, it's here just to sort of describe the process. And you can see it goes through each section that we expect to be in a grazing plan. What are your objectives? And and you describe that in the locations and, and sensitive areas and what's the, what's the condition of the vegetation out there. And, and it even goes through, it talks about how to um, do a forage balance and figure out about how much forage the, the livestock are gonna need and, and figure out kind of a, a, about how many days the, the livestock will, have, will, will be out there to, to reach those goals. So this was another thing that we put together. But you can see this is what, six, seven pages of document. And when you start filling it out, it gets longer. <laughs> so our typical grazing plans can be 10 to 12 pages long when you start putting all the necessary documentation in there. And that um, it's burdensome. It takes some time to be able to do that. Um, and this summer we, we ran into a situation where um, with, the, with the drought that we had here in Minnesota, a lot of people, um, ranchers were looking to do grazing in ways and in areas that they maybe weren't willing to do before. Um, so we really made a push and an ask of some of our, our wildlife managers to take a look at things that you maybe could graze this year that um, you hadn't thought about or maybe you planned to burn it and the burn didn't happen because we had a wet spring or because of COVID or whatever. And um, let's 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 open up our eyes a little bit and, and look to see what what options are out there. And um, of course, when I sat down to write grazing plans for for those areas that came up, I didn't have the time to write a 12 page document. So what we did was we, we were able to shorten it a little bit. And um, I ended up we did what we what I called you know, just short term grazing plans. And these were plans that I put together. Um, you know, I, I think I did like three in a week at the end of August because all of a sudden we had all this interest in people that were able to graze. Um, and they were just a couple pages long. It got down to the nitty gritty. It said, this is what we need to do and this is how we're gonna do it. So that was a big win this year that we were able to um, do some of those grazing plans on a much more shorter notice and quicker turnaround. So that was the, basic things that I that I had to touch on. And Greg noted that depending on in the area of the state, there may be options to barter for services instead of fees. Yeah, we've had people do things like do um, um, uh, food pot, plot plantings or uh, mow parking lots, things like that in exchange for grazing fees. Uh, and if we don't utilize a plan, would you recommend asking a lessee to work directly with NRCS? Um, yeah, if NRCS will help you develop a grazing plan. Um, I know here in Minnesota, uh, we went from, I think I have them all listed here from back in 2012, we went from having, um, there was one more even, so there was six of us in the state. I'm not NRCS, but I do grazing plans. Uh, we went from having six of us to, I think there's only two of us still writing grazing plans. <laughs> so if your NRCS isn't um, as busy as, as ours is, they might be able to help you do that. And I know that Jeff has done quite a few here in Minnesota too. So, yeah. So I'm gonna stop sharing that screen and first ask if you have any questions for me on the starting of our or grazing plan. And then I brought my special guest here. This is my husband, Bill. Um, because as I was listening to the presentations yesterday, I thought, 
there is one piece missing and that is the producer's perspective. And I can talk to you a little bit about what it's like um, working on public land and, and working um, from the private producer side, but um, this is the guy that does all the hard work. So I thought I'd bring him in and, and let you ask him directly. What made you choose to expand into grazing on public land? As a producer? Yes. Uh, availability. They were, there's a couple of, uh, what do you call them, w, WMAs? WPAs. Yeah. W, WPAs that border uh, our land. So it, it was really easy to begin with. Um, the first piece that we ever did, I just had to run one wire because it was, you had our fences on uh, three sides of it already. So I just had to run a wire and um, get a permit and open a gate. There was, there was no hauling. It was, uh, it was pretty simple. So that was the, that was the beginning of it. And then, uh, just basically expanded from there and it like i say they're uh they were just so close and land that i'd driven by my entire life and had never been used or uh, there was no upkeep on them and uh, i guess i kind of got a kick out of it how long did it did it take you're putting grazing on the land before you thought it became profitable for you to do so. Well, 18 years ago, I don't remember what we paid, um, but it wasn't much. And there, were, you know, especially those first pieces, there wasn't there wasn't a lot of work to them. So, I would say, right away. I mean, I, I don't know if you make money or save money or whatever it is, but um it, there is definitely a benefit right away a question from the chat is how far are you willing to transport your cattle from your home farm to a site if you were to transport that would really depend on um you know if the fence was there how bad i needed it um and the, the biggest thing is how long you can have them there. You know, these ones here, if you're just looking at a 30 day deal and, uh, and you're not gonna, you're not gonna haul them too far. Um, I do have cattle that are 220 miles away, but I mean, that's not a, that's not a wildlife deal. Uh, if you can just take them and leave them for the year and have somebody up there to watch them. Um, that's a whole different deal than having to haul them, say 40, 50 miles to leave them there for a month. You know, that certainly wouldn't be worth it. Um, to answer the question, how far? I, I don't know, it would, it would all depend. Yeah, it really depends on, on, on what kind of infrastructure is there if you have somebody in the area that can keep an eye on them daily and then how long you can keep them there. Yeah, the, the length of time is, is such a big deal. Yeah, and this, this is Greg. And the, the other thing we have noted that, yeah, I mean, closest sounds best, but if the person closest is a real pain to work with, then that's not your best cooperator. Um, and we have had that situation. And I know the, the Litchfield Wetland Management District, um, which is Fish and Wildlife Service, they have people ship cattle in from, I think, over 100 miles. And what they do is they, they hire the quote unquote local kid, um, a nearby neighbor to do kind of the day to day checking on things. And then they come up once every week or two to kind of do a more thorough check. Um, but that happens to be a fantastic cooperator um, for that office to work with, and they've got a good relationship. Um, so in that case, it's actually better to bring in somebody from a distance than perhaps the neighbor who, who isn't quite as um, e easy to work with. So it, it, it really does come down to relationships as, as a couple of people said yesterday. 
Another question from the chat for Kelly and Greg. What have you observed as the greatest barriers to getting cattle onto wildlife management areas or waterfowl production areas? Uh, I would say uh, the time it takes, well, maybe just the, a, a manager's comfort with, with the tool is the biggest one. And then once you have a manager that's that's comfortable with trying grazing um, and, and willing to do it, it becomes um, the time uh, to uh, get the plan together and then keep it monitored and think, you know, just to make sure that everything's going smoothly out there. Do you agree, Greg? Yeah, and like, you know, like I said in one, in one of my first slides is, I mean, it, it, it takes a lot of time to do this. Um, this, is, this is not always easy, especially in the first couple of years. And yeah, I know we're, you know, with the, the hiring freeze and things like that, you know, we're, we're, our staff are down quite a bit. We're gonna try and get a bunch of positions filled. Um, but, you know, we have a lot of, a lot of uh, offices around the state that there used to be a manager, an assistant manager, a technician, a seasonal person, um, you know, four to five people in that office, and now there's one person. Um, and like I said, hopefully that's going to start to cure itself um, in the near future. But but right now, that that workload issue is pretty significant for for our field staff. Oh, it, can can we call on some on one of the people that are uh, that are attending? Because Mark Papish is a is I think he's still on and I hate to call him out if, if you can't talk then I'm sorry just just stay quiet but what what keeps you from doing more grazing <laughs> yeah there you go can hi you hear me? can hear you yeah thank you so much for calling me out of the group <laughs> um no it is time I mean the infrastructure requirements are just that um you know we have we have objectives I mean you know, one great thing is, you know, I will say that the objectives and uh, successes when implemented right, you know, are, uh, there's no concession on either part if everything goes right, you know. So um, the fencing restraints are big, time restraints are big. And um, yeah, it's, it's not a, you know, like, like I said, it's, it's, I think it's intended as a precision tool, you know, and it's an effective precision tool, but that takes time. Oh, so you don't cut a diamond with one whack. Right. Just. Sorry, I just thought, I thought it might be good to hear from one of the experts out there. Great comment. Now, Looking at the experience in 2012, how was the proposal to get grazing really like hardline funded? How was that carried out? Was that producer group? Um, give a little detail as to how to successfully educate the legislature on what is needed to forward grazing on public land. I didn't say it was funded. <laughs> I just said that if they took in any money that they got to keep it in the program. So that's been that's been a little bit of a stumbling block too or that's been a hurdle is is especially when we had those very um, robust fence standards that you have to have this four strand high tensile fence. Um, things really slowed down because nobody had the money to put up that fence. Um, we, we have had a lot of help from um, the Nature Conservancy. They've done, come in and put up fences. I believe Pheasants Forever has done some fencing on, on WMAs. Um, and there, Greg, didn't we have a LCCMR grant early on too that, that helped pay for some of that infrastructure? Yeah, that, that finished up about 2015, um, and then our Outdoor Heritage Fund do a, a fair amount of fencing with that. Yeah, so Minnesota's get Minnesota gets funding through um, a, a tax amendment and also through the uh, the the lottery 
to do some of this stuff and and, and it requires a plan you, know, you don't just get the money you gotta apply for the apply for a grant and have a pretty good reason to do it but we did have some money early on that helped pay for some permit fencing but it wasn't from the legislature <laughs> How often do you rotate your livestock on your waterfall production area? Uh, they're, they're all different. Uh, some of them are just one piece. Um, the two that I did this year were just cut in half. I think the one was... Uh, 24 days on each cell and the other one was 35 days on each cell so it all depends on the piece yeah we don't do a lot of um really management intensive grazing especially on the, the wpas one of the biggest um objectives out there is just litter reduction um and, and then of course on these the two that we grazed this year they hadn't seen any kind of management for Oh, 50 years it yeah they they sat for quite a while and with the drought this year we we're you know just able to get in there and and get into some of the wet areas and lay down some cattails and um just a real general um general disturbance on that so we haven't done anything too management intensive uh if we were to do that it would require um some more uh, We'd have to put in some water lines or, or do some hauling water and things like that because they're right now they're just getting water from the wetlands on site. Um, so we'd really have to we'd have to put a lot of thought into how um, how we would uh, get water to the cattle if we were to do some more management intensive grazing. We did some haul water out there. We did, yeah, we did. There was water hauled out there this year, but it was just in one spot. We didn't have to bring it to bring it all over way back to the back ends of it. Were you able to successfully reduce the, the litter to where you wanted it? I guess that would be a question for JB if, it, if, if he thought it was a successful, but I think it was, you know, as I look, you know, I have to look at it through the lens of a, you know, as Bill's wife, and then also through the lens of, a, you know, a conservation grazing specialist and, um, I would say yes, what, what needed to be done out there was done very well. Well, thank you everyone. Uh, thank you, especially to our speakers today, Kelly and Bill and Greg and Greg. <laughs> we really appreciate everybody sharing their expertise with us. And, and yesterday, the past two days have been great. Thank you all for attending. I hope it was useful to you and that you learned some things. Um, the conversation does not have to end here, as I've said many times. Uh, there is a discussion group on Regain dedicated to um, this topic. And Jane just dropped the link in um, for to sign up for Regain to join that chat. So as you have questions over the next few days, um, you can start a discussion on there and get your peers help in troubleshooting. We'll also put the slides uh, from, the, from the last two days, the, the presentations in that discussion group. And then the recordings um, from these sessions, we'll also we'll put those up on YouTube um, so you can watch it whenever you'd like. Um, and we are also going to drop in a link to the exit survey. If you took it yesterday, you don't need to take it again today, but your feedback, we really appreciate your feedback and we need it um, as we design any other uh, future uh, presentations and series and you know, if you want, we talked about doing a 201 series. If you're interested, take the exit survey and let us know. We also welcome any um, ideas of future speakers or anything like that. So um, with that, I will, re will release you all. Um, thank you, especially to my partners in crime as well. I want to say thank you, Mary C. Anderson and Jane uh, for helping put this on the last couple of days. And thank you all for attending. And I hope that everybody has a great rest of your week.